This is a 1956 Morris Minor Series 2 and it is one of the most enduring images of Britain in the 50s along with the Queen's coronation, Harold Macmillan's moustache and state-sponsored discrimination. A little-known Greek fella named Alec Isagonis fled to Britain in the 1920s and was found to be pretty adept at designing cars. He was hired by Morris and set out to design his first real icon. Such an icon, in fact, that this little car has become the embodiment of Old England. The Second World War had practically stalled the entire motor industry, and most models were looking a little old hat as the march of technology surpassed the industry. The powers that be at Morris saw Isagonis as the man to address this and replaced the old Morris 8 with a modern small car filled with modern engineering. The man had loads of little ideas to eke more interior space out of the car's external dimensions. These wheels are 14 inches, a good chunk smaller than the 17s on the Morris 8. Not only did this mean there was less unsprung weight, but smaller wheels also mean smaller wheel arches, and therefore more space for the cabin. Many cars of the time had a beam axle at the front, but by introducing independent front suspension, that meant the engine could be pushed as far forward as possible. Not only would this increase cabin space, but it also improved weight distribution. Isagonis had also originally wanted an all-new flat 4 engine for the Miner. Not only would this have lowered the centre of gravity, but it too could have improved practicality, as it'd be about, well, about this much less room needed for the engine. Unfortunately, the resources just weren't there, but we'll get back to this engine bay in a little bit. The Miner also benefited from its unibody construction, meaning there isn't a separate chassis beneath the body. It means the car is lighter, more rigid, and uses less steel, which is important after the war. Isagonis also wanted rack and pinion steering, and this, along with the unibody, would massively improve handling. Now, none of these ideas were new. They'd all been seen before on other cars, and Isagonis himself had been pushing them since the 1930s. But when they all came together on what was a small economy car, it was a revelation, especially considering how much more modern it was than the old Morris 8. We have to bear in mind four things here. One, that Britain in the 1940s was austere with a capital A. Number two, that a heater was an option at the beginning. Number three, that there was still rationing. And number four, that Morris was the biggest manufacturer in the UK at the time. This was a big deal. The prototype car with all these features was known as the Mosquito. And although it carried the basic shape of the minor body, it had much more radical aerodynamic styling with the headlamps hidden behind the grille. But before it could make production, William Morris had a few things to say. The old man hated everything about the car, from its unconventional styling to its expensive engines, and it was clear that not everything was going to make the cut. Not only was money an issue just after the war, but Morris wanted their new small car to be launched at the first motor show after the war in October 1948. That flat four engine was the main distraction, and it had to go, replaced by the same side valve engine from the Morris 8. Isagonis had originally wanted torsion bar suspension all round, but that was replaced at the back by a traditional live axle on leaf springs. This means the car was a shadow of what it could have been, but it was by no means disappointing. Here was a practical, fresh-looking small car that could power Morris forwards into the 1950s and compete with the latest offering from their old foe, Austin. The Morris Miner was finally ready for production, but at the 11th hour, Isagonis grew unhappy with the car's appearance. The problem was that it was too narrow. The quick and cheap solution he came up with became a styling touch in itself. Pre-war cars had always been very narrow, but with the transatlantic styling themes he was so keen on, the Miner just didn't look right. That solution was to make the whole car four inches wider, and you can see that in this strip that goes down the center of the bonnet. So that's how this little car was born, but nobody at the time could have seen just how synonymous with its nation this car would become. It's as British as Fish and Chips and Marks and Spencer. Just as well then that Isagonis was Greek, Michael Marx was Polish, and Battered Fish is Portuguese. As many of you will already have noticed, this particular car is a 1956 Series 2 Morris Minor. 
That means it's quite a bit different than the first cars to roll off the Cowley production lines in 1948. We'll start with the most obvious differences down here at the front. Very early MM series cars were hardest hit by that last minute widening and that even was shown in the bumpers. You see, Morris had already tooled up and so all the early cars had a four inch stretch of body colour across the middle of the bumper here where the hole for the starting handle is. Another difference was the headlamps. You see, Morris wanted to export the Miner to the United States but quickly found that it didn't meet their regulations. Unthinkable nowadays I know, but that is a gonus for you. The problem was that they were too low. You might remember we mentioned the Mosquito before, which had the headlamps hidden down here behind the grille. Well, the early MM series cars had the lights at the side of the grille down here. In my view, that also made the car look quite ugly, but that regulation meant that they had to move them up here to a much more conventional position on the wings. Predictably, Isagonis didn't like the change. The biggest difference, however, was the engine. The original MM series cars used the old 917cc Morris side valve engine. It produced about 27 brake horsepower and propelled the Miner to 60 miles per hour in just under a minute and had a top speed of about 60 miles per hour. While this wasn't calamitous, it was still ridiculously slow. It just didn't match the modern direct steering that Isagonis had designed in and started to fall behind its contemporaries. Earlier I mentioned Morris's old foe Austin and up the road at Longbridge they developed an all new overhead valve four cylinder engine that you might have heard of, known as the A-Series. In 1952 Morris and Austin merged to form the British Motor Corporation and that meant the miner became the recipient of the entire drivetrain from its biggest rival, the Austin A30. Under the bonnet now was the 803cc A-series engine, producing about 30 brake horsepower. A little better than before, but still very leisurely. The Miner would finally move into the motorway age from 1956 with the birth of the Morris Miner 1000, which eventually ended up with a 1098cc A-series engine and nearly 50 horsepower. It meant you could do nearly 80. Amazing. The introduction of the 1000 also massively increased the desirability of the Miner, as it finally had the poke to go with the handling. In 1960 it became the first British car to reach 1 million units. But that could only last so long as BMC modernised through cars like the Mini and Morris 1100. Production ceased in 1971 with 1 1.3 million units having been built in the 23 year run. With this being a late Series 2 car, you still get a few slices of antiquity, such as the split front windscreen, the dinky rear screen, and mad trafficators on the side. Miners could be specified with an array of body styles. There were the two and four door saloons, like this one, a two door convertible, a two door estate with structural wood at the back, and there was a van and a pickup. The commercial miners did have a proper separate chassis at the back, so a buyer could put their own body on top. This design is now over 70 years old, and by anyone's reckoning the architecture underneath is completely archaic. So why are they so well loved? First of all, parts are everywhere, and later minor thousands are more than capable of keeping up with modern traffic. I know a good few people that not only drive miners, but only have Morris Miners. And then there are the more obvious reasons. I mean, just look at it. It's so adorable. That big bubbly styling makes anybody with a heart absolutely gush over one of these little fellas. It's just perfect. There's also something really desirable nowadays about a car with really characterful styling, big round headlamps and lashings of chrome. And this one's in my favorite BMC color, almond green. The styling was also a massive departure from Morris's that came before, as Isagonis brought with him lots of transatlantic styling influences. Inside, the story is the same. It is typical Isagonis. And this is a dashboard that the miner took through to 1971, and it is a symmetrical design with the speedometer in the center. It's pretty minimalist and has everything you need and nothing that you don't. In front of you, of course, is this huge steering wheel, so huge so that it makes the steering lighter, and I can confirm, it's pretty light. 
it is this wonderful design with this wooden rim to it and it's very very delicate as well to make the steering all that much nicer in the center is a horn push of course the very characteristic 1950s horn push of course no indicator stalk so your indicator switch is over here on the dashboard and there is a little switch for the trafficators down here to your right in front of you is just a little glove compartment really and the same on the passenger side to hold your cleaning cloths your model morris miners books things like that in the center is the only instrument in the car the big speedometer going up to 80 miles per hour and a little fuel gauge at the bottom it all has a gold background which is very nice as well you just get telltales at the top for your indicators and your main beam and then warnings at the bottom for your oil pressure and your charge below the speedometer is a row of pull switches on the left hand side you have the pull for your manual choke and then a pull for your wipers which of course are clap hand wipers because there you go the key will turn which of course are clap hand wipers because it has a split windscreen and they don't park so i'll need to park them manually then you have your light switch which of course also lights up the background of the speedometer there is a little switch under here to turn that off apparently not a lot of people know about that but there is a little switch here to turn off your instrument illumination if it just becomes too bright having this instrument lit up during the night. Then on the right hand side you have the starter, which is always live but of course it won't start without the ignition turned. The final switch up on the dashboard is the pump for the washers. At the bottom here you have a little ashtray which is a necessity on a car from the 1950s because you need an ashtray because everybody smokes. Below that you have the simple little Smith's heater which just has a little switch on the front of it to turn the heater fan on or off. You can't control the heat itself from inside the car on this car. You have to go under the bonnet and turn a little valve. Around the heater is a massive shelf down there for your odds and ends, books etc. And it is genuinely quite capacious. If I can just get this county roadmap, Yorkshire from at some point in the 50s or 60s it is bmc branded and it cost five shillings how wonderful is that that lives down on that little shelf so the dashboard is very very practical and the car despite feeling quite narrow as a lot of post-war cars do it's more than practical enough for four people to be rather comfortable in on the floor you have your dip switch as did a lot of British cars of the time that's to switch your main beam on of course and then you have your pedals the clutch and brake pedals are floor mounted on the minor and the throttle pedal is mounted from the top as would be a little bit more traditional of course in the center you have your gear stick which as it goes straight into the top of the gearbox is very very lovely it's such a precise direct gear change now despite the fact that the throw is absolutely enormous between the gears it's still a very 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 nice gear change to use just because of its direct nature of course four speed gearbox and across here for reverse then of course have your handbrake in the center which has the cables exposed just for extra oldie worldiness the window line is very very high which maybe makes you feel ever so slightly claustrophobic you know quite low down in the car claustrophobic is the wrong word sit quite low down it does mean there is stacks and stacks of headroom which is good for taller people the seats of course are not very supportive they are just very flat very green very lovely uh, but they will not hold you in not that you'd be cornering very quick in a morris minor anyway just as in the wolseley hornet i did a video on last week the seats just kind of fold down like that despite this being a four-door car and they don't need to fold they still do the doors are very basic there is no door pocket at the bottom there is just a door handle and a lovely leather door pull of course wind up windows which are quite small wind up windows really but look at the look at the action on that very very quick uh, the windows going down very practical in that respect and the highlight of any car from this era quarter light windows just to let a little bit more air in or to let the cigarette smoke out either or at the top there are two little tiny sun visors the passenger one with a mirror in and the driver's one with this plate over it just you know to actually make it work as a sun visor a little bit better but yes the car is more than big enough it is of course on the bijou side of luxury 
but it is a lovely place to be very period i love the painted metal i love the green everywhere the green is fantastic in this car so this interior is a lovely place to be very very period very very classic and very practical as well you have loads of storage and more than enough room for four people to feel comfortable should we go have a sit in the back the back is plenty big enough for me and my picnic basket and the seat is nice and squishy springy and very comfortable there isn't that much leg room but especially with the lack of headrests and the glass here it feels very airy it's a very nice place to be back here your feet obviously do also slide underneath the front seats so again much more practical or you could just push the seat forward and have a lot more knee room MM Series and Series 2 Morris Miners have a smaller rear window than the later Minor 1000, which makes it feel a little bit dark here, but the windows are more than big enough. And as they go quite far forward before you get to the B pillar, you, can, you have a really good view out of the road. Again, the door furniture is very, very simple. You just have the window winder, of course, again, a very quick action, a door handle and a nice door pull. To lock these doors, you just push the handles forwards and that's the door locked. Now there is one in bit of impracticality here which is this big lip here on the wheel arch which means getting in and out of the car is a little bit more of a challenge than maybe it ought to be. Maybe that's not the best design but that's just the way it is. It is a little bit of a stretch to get over that lip there. Now there are a few things in this car that I'd like to show you because it is a wonderful, wonderful example of a Series 2 Morris Minor. A very honest car and it has been restored but it was restored in the 1980s so that's so long ago now it's led another life since then. The first thing I'm going to show you is down here. Now you're wondering what on earth is a brick doing in a Morris Minor? Well, this is a brick from the Cowley factory that was presented by the Morris Minor Owners Club in 2002. Of course, Cowley was the place where the Morris Minor was built, the traditional Morris factory, uh, the site of which now makes minis for BMW. But when part of the factory was demolished, this is a brick from that factory. So there's one brilliant bit of general Morris Minor history. Of course, you have little bits like this picnic basket, a copy of Practical Motorist from July 1959, and you have this book. This book that chronicles the life of Minty Mo, the name of this fantastic little Morris Minor. So this has everything in it, all the adventures that the car has been on through its history, and some fantastic written accounts, all the tax discs that the car has ever had. A wonderful, wonderful bit of history, very nicely compiled as well. So this car was restored in the early 80s by a man called Mr. Parry. He fitted these inertia reel seatbelts, which are probably a good idea considering this car never had any seatbelts when it was new. He owned the car until he died in 2003 when the current owner took ownership of Minty Mo and still owns her to this day. So one final little thing I'll show you is the fact that despite it being a saloon car from the 1940s, the rear seat does actually fold down, which is another fantastic practical asset to the car, along with the very, very squeaky seats in the back. So there we are then, a car that was not only immensely popular in its day, but also exudes 50s charm, style, character, and can't help but make you love it for what it is. It's a cuddly little friend that, despite its very modern engineering, has become an icon of long summer afternoons and quaint little English villages, all thrumming to the tune of an A-series. For now, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'll have more videos coming along soon.